Amen. First Timothy chapter number one, the Bible starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now, this letter from Paul to Timothy is one preacher speaking to another. It's one pastor or, you know, preacher, leader, writing to uh, his young protege in the ministry. The Apostle Paul is the mentor of Timothy. And so these are known as the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, because he's writing to a pastor. And these three books have a lot in common with one another, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, in that they're written at a high level. It's, it's a lot of the meat of the word, a lot of just strong doctrine, because you'd imagine that if one experienced preacher is talking to another preacher, he's probably going to go a little bit deeper or, or talk about some really advanced teachings. He's not going to be giving him the milk of the word, right? Because of the fact that, you know, when you teach the church, you're talking to people at all different levels. You know, you're talking to people that are very mature spiritually and other people who just got saved. Whereas, you know, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he's writing to an experienced, mature preacher. So it's, it's very advanced teaching. And so he's giving advice to this younger preacher. And he says in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. So get the picture that Paul and Timothy are there in Ephesus. And Paul is going to go into Macedonia to, to basically continue to evangelize and go preach in other places. But he wants to leave someone behind in order to make sure that things stay right in Ephesus. So this is exactly what we see at the beginning of Titus, right? Where he says in Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou mightest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So Paul evangelizes in Crete, but he wants to leave somebody there to make sure that things stay right, that the doctrine stays right, that the, the right pastors get ordained, etc. So in the same way that Titus was left in Crete, Timothy is being left at Ephesus. And he's there to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He wants to make sure that they don't change and get off into weird doctrine and start teaching uh, bad things. He says in verse 4 a little bit of what those specific doctrines are that he's nervous about. Okay, And he says in verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So notice he's warning Timothy about the same things that he warned Titus about. Because in Titus, he warns him about the questions about the law, contentions about the law. He says there are many unruly and vain talkers. And he says, especially those of the circumcision, right? So he's warning about the Jews and the Judaizers. And he's also bringing up to both of them to avoid the genealogies. So you can see that the same type of false teaching that was a problem in Ephesus, which is over in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, is the same kind of thing that they're running into on the island of Crete. The Judaizers, the Jews, the genealogies, the, 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 the uh, bringing them under the law and, and, and uh, desiring to be teachers of the law, etc. The Jewish fables he brings up in Titus. Here he just says fables. In verse 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So in verse 4, he's saying, Don't give heed to fables, genealogies, questions. He said, he said, They minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. And then he says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. So what's he trying to explain here? He's trying to explain here that the goal is charity out of, a good, out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. He doesn't want Timothy to lose sight of what the point of it all is, okay? And what I mean by that is that these other things, fables and endless genealogies, those things can be interesting to talk about. They can be fun studies and, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? But at the end of the day, what does it really profit? 
You know, at the end of the day, uh, just arguing about the law or, or getting into just these, these really minutia of details, these questionable doctrines, and uh, getting into things that are, that are really just not important. He's saying, you know, what we need to think about is what the goal is. You know, charity out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, faith unfeigned. And then he says in verse 6, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. So instead of focusing on things that matter, things that are important, doctrines that actually have something to do with the way that we live our lives and with the way that we practice and what we believe, some people have turned aside unto vain jangling. And remember in Titus, he just called it vain talkers. People who just talk about things that don't matter. Now, what does jangling mean? I, I, I recently heard someone criticize this verse. They said that this is too archaic. You know, uh, people aren't going to be able to understand this in 2019 because the King James is so archaic here when it says, from which some having swerved. Does everybody know what it means to swerve? I don't think that's an archaic word. I mean, if you're driving down the road and you swerve, what does that mean? It means you turned, but not only did you turn, you didn't just turn, you swerved. Swerve means you're just, yeah, turn sharply. There you go. So, you know, you're just kind of, dum, 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 dum. whoa! This is what Paul's afraid of happening, okay? So basically, think about this. You know, he has won people to Christ. He has founded churches, and he wants them to continue driving down that freeway, you know, trying to get toward what? You know, charity out of a good conscience, pure heart, faith unfeigned. He wants them to be godly, mature Christians. He wants them to do real work of the Lord. He wants them to evangelize and win people to Christ. Later in the book, he's going to tell them, do the work of an evangelist. And, and he wants them to, you know, ordain elders, pastor churches, do the work of God and to talk about things that matter, not the vain stuff, but to talk about things that matter, care about things that matter, and be sound doctrinally. Don't let people teach weird doctrine and everything like that. And what he's, what he's afraid of happening and what he has seen happen to some people is that they're just, the churches are going along, people, Christians are going along, and then all of a sudden it's just like, woo, just a radical detour into some dumb thing, right? Whether it's some Judaizing doctrine, all of a sudden they want to blow a shofar and they want to talk about Shabbat Shalom and they, they're going to start eating kosher food, or, or they get off on, you know, um, just way into conspiracy theories or they get really deep into politics or something. Just whatever it is where they, they swerve from just continuing in the work of the Lord. You know, there are people who continue year after year, decade after decade serving God. And then there are those who swerve into what? This is so archaic. They've swerved and turned. So he defined what swerved meant right there. Just in case you don't know what it means to swerve. He said, some having swerved have turned aside. Swerve is just to let you know it was a sharp turn. So this can happen fast. You can go off the rails fast here. Okay, It doesn't take long for a church to apostatize or for a Christian to get pulled away from what's important, winning people to Christ, reading your Bible, raising your family, and get off on some dumb tangent that doesn't matter. But he says they've turned aside into vain jangling. And I submit to you that the word jangling is not an archaic word either. If you just stop and think, what does it mean to jangle? What is jangling? You know, when I hear the word jangling, this is what I think of. Right? I mean, who thinks of that when you hear the word jangling? Pretty much everybody because that's not an archaic word. So these don't jangle very well because they're all these like plastic keys. But, um, you know, if you had metal keys, that do you have a better jangle? Yours are, you got the plastics. Everybody's got these electronic, plastic, deal. there we go. That's the noise I was looking for. Yeah, you know, basically, you know, this kind of noise is what we're talking about, right? This is jangling. So the point is there, there's a lot of noise, but it doesn't signify anything. It doesn't mean anything, okay? It's just, it's like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So when you talk about vain things, it's just a vain jangling, just blah, blah, blah. That's what he means when he says they've turned aside into vain jangling. So again, people attack the King James, but that, that's not an archaic verse. I mean, we, you can understand this, no problem. And it's a very vivid image of what Paul wants to get across here, of just a bunch of noise, and they're not making any sense. And he says in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law. So again, another reference to the Judaizing element. 
They want to be teachers of the law, but they neither understand what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, that's an interesting word, affirm. What does it mean to affirm something? Well, just think, you're making it firm. You're basically saying, hey, this is for sure right. So it's not that they're just saying things. It's not that they're just getting up and saying, hey, here's what the Bible says, and they don't know what they're talking about. They're getting up and saying, this is what the Bible says, and this is for sure what it means. And they actually don't have a clue what they're talking about. They understand, isn't that what it says? They understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. I mean, they are just laying this down as this is fact. And they're completely wrong. So Paul's concerned about this. He's saying, look, you know, you need to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't listen to fables. Don't follow the endless genealogies. Some people have swerved. They've turned aside into vain jangling. I mean, this is the first generation of Christianity. Think about that. I mean, this Christianity is a new thing. And the Apostle Paul, we're talking about his ministry here is only a few decades after Christ has risen from the dead. So we're in the first generation of Christianity. People are already swerving into vain jangling. Okay. He says they're desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good. So it's not the law that's the problem. We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Okay, so what he's trying to say here is that although there are the Judaizers who abuse the law, who misuse the law, who don't understand the law, we don't want to throw out the law in our zeal to be against the Judaizers. So the Judaizers love to talk about the Torah and all that, but we don't want to accidentally overreact to that and say like, oh man, these Jews, they're, they're trying to bring us under the law. And they're trying to make us kosher. So then just get to the point where we just completely just throw out the law and say, hey, we're only going to read out of the New Testament. We're not going to listen to anything that Exodus says. We're not going to listen to anything Leviticus says. We need to understand that the law is good. We need to know that the law is good. Paul said, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law, right? One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So it's not the law that's the problem. It's the people that are misusing the law that's the problem, okay? And specifically, he explains here that the law is not made for a righteous man. Here's what we need to know if we're going to properly understand the law and properly use the law. Knowing this, we got to know this going in, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. And of course, I already preached a whole sermon on that last Sunday night, where I explain the fact that, yeah, we're not under the law, but that's because we're saved and we're walking in the Spirit. But if you're not walking in the Spirit, then the law is of use to correct you and get you back on the right path. And certainly to this unsaved world, they need the law. Because are they under grace? They're not saved. So the law is not made for a righteous man. And of course, I'm not going to review last week's sermon too much, but, you know, last Sunday night... I talked about the fact that if, it, you know, if all the laws were to cease to exist tomorrow, most of the people in our church would just continue living the life that they've always lived and nothing would even change. I would get up and do the exact same things tomorrow, but what would wicked people do? They'd go crazy, right? They'd burn it all down and, and murder and rape and pillage and rob. Okay, so that's who the law is for. We have to have laws. We don't believe in anarchy because we have to have laws for the wicked people of this world, right? The more wicked people are, the more rules you have to have, the more laws you have to have. If people are just good and doing the right things, you can have very few laws, very few rules. That's why our church doesn't have a lot of rules, because our church isn't filled with bozos where we have to just have tons of rules or something to try to, you know, preempt all the dumb things that are going to happen. So it says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. And then he lists off, who is the law made for? Why do we need the law? For the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So let me ask you this. Can any of the people on this list say, whoa, don't bring me under the law, I'm under grace, if they're doing the things on this list, then someone could say, well, the law is made for you. If you're a whoremonger, 
Whoa, you legalist. Don't tell me not to be a whoremonger. Look, if you're a liar, a perjurer, a kidnapper, that's what a men stealer is, right? Murderer of father, murderer of mother. You can't play that under grace card because the Bible here is saying that the law is made for people like you because without the law, society would descend into chaos because of people like this, okay? So it's crystal clear that the law is not being repealed for people like this, okay? Those of us that are saved and we're walking in the Spirit, we're going to intuitively fulfill the law. So nobody who's walking in the Spirit's going around lying. Nobody's walking in the Spirit's going around being a whoremonger, committing perjury, murder, all these other things, okay? Of course, in the flesh, a saved person could do those things. And then they ought to be punished by the law. Amen? Now, on this list, as he goes through all these different things, most of which are pretty extreme sins, okay? I mean, the mildest thing on the list is, is lying. But most of the things on this list are pretty extreme when you're talking about murdering your father or slaying men or stealing men or being a whoremonger. I mean, these are some pretty big sins, right? Well, one of the sins that's on this list is of particular interest. Okay, and that is this one that says, them that defile themselves with mankind. Okay, so it says in verse 10, for whoremongers and for them that defile themselves with mankind. So this term is a subject of great controversy in 2019 today. Okay, what does this mean, them that defile themselves with mankind? Okay, now if you would, keep your finger here and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 6 uses the same term, and it, it's used in only these two places. So it's not used anywhere else in the Bible. It's only used in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and 1 Timothy chapter number 1. These are the two places where you're going to find this term. In 1 Timothy, it is them that defile themselves with mankind. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it is abusers of themselves with mankind, but these are the exact same thing. These are just two different ways to phrase the same thing. Abusers of themselves with mankind, they that defile themselves with mankind. What is this term referring to? What does this mean? Now, tonight I'm going to ask that you put on your thinking cap a little bit, okay? We need to think as Christians. We need to use our minds, right? Don't just love the Lord with all your heart but love them with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, right? So when we come to church, it's important that we get motivated and inspired and encouraged, but we also need to learn. And today we are living in an illogical time. We are living in a time when men call good evil and evil good. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They call light darkness and dark light. So we need to stop and think because our minds have been clouded with so much junk and we need to be logical. And let me tell you something. There's false doctrine that's out there and it is a result of people not thinking about this logically, but they're just getting emotional and just they, they just don't want to believe something. So they just emotionally just say, that's wrong. I'm going to go with this over here. It has nothing to do with logic. It has nothing to do with what the Bible says. It's not what the Holy Ghost teaches. It's just them getting emotional. We need to read the Bible and, and think about what it's. God gave us a brain and he said, come, let us reason together. God is a reasonable God. The Bible is a reasonable book. It is a logical book, okay? You read the book of Romans, and Paul is making all these logical arguments, and he gives all the arguments. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by grace and not by the deeds of the law. And, and he explains, justified by faith, not by the deeds of the law. And he even uses words like reckon, impute, right? I mean, these are, these are words that you would use as like a bookkeeper or an accountant, or someone who's doing math. And, you know, so the Bible's a logical book. We should think about it logically, okay? And so I want you to just think about this logically because this is a controversial thing. And so I want to just show you what the Bible says here. Now, first of all, this term, abusers of themselves with mankind, or those that defile themselves with mankind, what some will not try to do 
to snow you on this issue is they'll take you back to the Greek. Okay. Beware of this. Because what people are doing when they're taking you back to the Greek is they're taking you somewhere where you have a total disadvantage because you don't speak Greek, right? So what they're trying to do is put you in a land where you have no answer. They're going to tell you and you're just like, oh, okay. I mean, you know, if someone showed you Chinese and said, well, here's what the Chinese says, you kind of have to just take their word for it, right? Well, most people, if you showed them the Greek here, you might as well show them Chinese. They don't know Greek. So therefore, per, this is a perfect way for preachers to get up and lie and say, oh, forget what it says in English. The Greek word there means homosexual, practicing homosexual. Or, or what, they'll, what they'll say in the concordances, what they'll say in the lexicons, what they'll say in the uh, commentaries, what they'll say in these books is they'll say, well, it's the... It's the, uh, it, it's the um, the aggressor in the relationship. You, you know you know these fag relationships will have like the one that's the more manly and the one that's the, the more effeminate, the husband and the wife or whatever. You know, they'll say, oh, it's the, it's the, the, the you know, whatever. I don't even want to go into it because it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. But anyway, you know, they'll try to just pin this down. You know, you open these concordances, uh, lexicons, and they'll just say, oh, the Greek word here, here's what it means, it's a homo and whatever. But here's the problem with that. Let me just explain to you why going back to the Greek on this word will tell you nothing. Let me explain to you why. This word is never used in any Greek literature outside the Bible. It's only used in two places. And they're in the Bible. 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Corinthians 6. So it's not like you could say, oh, well, look at all this other Greek literature where that word's being used about homos. Now listen, Greek literature talks a lot about homos because ancient Greek was filled with that sin. It was filled with that perversion. So there are whole books about it. You know, Plato in his discourses, he talks all about that issue and he never one time uses this word. Okay, this word is not used anywhere until after Paul used it. In fact, some people have even speculated, did Paul invent this term? Because there is not a shred of evidence of it ever being used anywhere else. So you can't go outside the Bible to try to define this word. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? You can't go outside the Bible and say, oh, well, I looked at this Greek literature and, you know, this is how they're using that word. No, there's no evidence. Zero. So when the concordance says, oh, this is a homosexual, that's just their opinion. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It's not fact. It's just that's what they think it means. Okay. Now, what the word literally would mean is basically the way the King James translators have translated it here for us. They've translated it here that it's someone who abuses themselves with mankind or lies with mankind. Now, they may have had other knowledge. They may have had access to other Greek literature that we don't know about. All their notes were burned up in a fire, so we don't know exactly why they translated it that way. We believe that the King James Bible is God's preserved word. We believe that it is the preservation of God's word, that it was providentially uh, uh, brought into our English language so that we could have the, the Bible in 2019 preserved and in the world's most important language, the lingua franca of our day. It makes perfect sense that God allowed such a great uh, group of 54 translators to come together and work on it for six years and put so much work and effort and toil into it to create what even secular scholars would say is one of the greatest literary works in the history of mankind, specifically the King James Bible. Okay. So who do you think knows more? The guy who went to Bible college for two semesters in Greek and learned 310 vocabulary words? Or the 54 experts who gave us the King James Bible? So we need to stick with what the King James says and get our doctrine based on what the King James says. Okay, so if we looked at the Greek word, like I said, it can't tell us anything because of the fact that it is not found in any Greek literature anywhere. It's only found in the Bible. So then other people will say, yeah, but if you go back to the Greek and, and you break it down into its two component parts, you know, uh, arsenokite, and they'll say, you know, arsen is male, arsenokite, kite means to lie or a bed or lie with. So it's, it's those who lie with men. Isn't that what it's saying in English too? 
if they're defiling themselves with mankind, if they're abusing themselves with mankind, what do, you, what do you think that meant when that said they're abusing themselves with mankind? You think they're walking up to men and saying, punch me in the stomach as hard as you can? <laughs> what do you think it meant when it said they abused themselves with mankind? Here, come on, punch me in the stomach as hard as you can. Is that what you think it meant? Or when it said they that defile themselves with mankind, do you think that, that, that they just rolled around in the mud or, uh, you know, just, I don't know, just, just did something unsanitary? Obviously, when it talks about defiling themselves with mankind or abusing themselves with mankind, I don't think there's any question what we're talking about here that it had to do with the bedroom. I mean, was anybody confused on that? So did you really have to go back to the Greek to figure that out? So what I'm trying to say is there's nothing in the Greek that's going to shed any light on this for you. It's all right here in English. All the evidence that you have in front of you in your lap right now is all the evidence that there is. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Here's what you'll find if you learn Greek and read the New Testament. It says the same thing that it says in English. And they, you could have just stuck with the English all along. That's what you'll learn, okay? So don't let people try to tell you that you need a foreign language to understand the Bible. You've got... The answer is right here in front of you. Now, what people will do with this verse, though, of abuse of themselves of mankind or them that defile themselves of mankind, they'll take this verse where it says in verse 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. And what they'll try to do here is try to say that these people are full-blown homos and sodomites who got saved. So they're, they're struggling to find an example of that in the Bible because we don't see any stories like that in the Bible. So they're saying, well, these people at Corinth, they were these full-blown homos or sodomites, and now they got saved. That's what they're using this verse as a proof text to prove. Now, I'm going to give you right now three explanations that make more sense than that and that don't contradict the rest of the Bible, like that would contradict a lot of other things that the Bible teaches. And then I'm going to give you a bonus point from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, here's the thing. Romans 1 talks about a group of people, right? You Don't get emotional. Let's think about it logically. Romans 1 talks about a group of people that have been given up by God. They've been given up, given over, given up, and he says that they hate God they don't even want to retain God in their knowledge, and they burn it with lust toward the same gender. Now, normal people don't burn with lust toward the same gender. So the Bible explains this process in Romans 1 about how a person gets to that point where they would actually burn with lust one toward another with the same gender because, you know, an explanation is needed because that isn't normal. You know, that's not the normal experience. So according to Romans 1, when you read Romans 1, it's pretty clear these people are rejected. That's what re reprobate means. They're rejected. They cannot be saved because they hate God and because they didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. They already had all these chances. They knew God. They glorified him not as God. They just kept getting more corrupt. And finally, on that just downward spiral of just rejecting Christ, hating God, the end of the trail is men with men burning in their lust one toward another. That's the final stop on that train of being rejected, reprobate, given over to a reprobate mind. Of course, John 12 talks about people who cannot believe because their minds have been darkened, their eyes have been blinded, their heart has been hardened. And that's what it says in Romans 1, their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, by whom? By God. The Bible talks about God blinding their eyes and hardening their hearts in John chapter 12. Why? Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, okay? And, and most of us here understand that. If not, go home and read Romans 1, and it should make sense to you. So we see that from Romans 1. So what people are trying to do is just ignore the teaching of Romans 1, and they just want to run over here to 1 Corinthians 6, not because of any logical or rational reason, but because it's convenient for them to want to soften up their stand on the homos. And I'm going to prove to you why this is illogical. Okay, by the time I'm done, there won't be any question to any sane or rational person who's listening to me that the position that is held by mainstream Christianity today about the Sodomites is a false doctrine. And that what I am teaching is actually correct and biblically correct. What I'm teaching verse by verse from Romans chapter 1. Okay, and all the other verses that talk about being reprobate, which I don't have time to go to. 
Now let me give you three explanations here because what they're trying to say, they're trying to say that the guy from Romans 1 who burns in his lust toward another man is the same guy from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and such were some of you, so that proves that those Romans 1 people can get saved. That makes no sense if you read Romans 1 that those people would end up getting saved. When they hate God, they don't even want to think about him. That's why God has totally rejected them and turned them over to these vile affections and whatever. And the doctrine that people can get beyond a point of salvation is believed by virtually everyone. Because if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you're done, right? You add to or remove from God's word, you're done. I mean, there, there are plenty of scriptures that teach that. You take the mark of the beast, you're done. Can't get saved. So... Let me give you three explanations that make more sense than to say, oh, these people can all be saved and let's go evangelize these pedophiles and, and you know, uh, full-blown sodomites, okay? Explanation number one is that 1 Corinthians 6, and, and look, I think all three of these are viable explanations. All three of them make more sense than what they're trying to teach out there. So you take your pick, okay? Explanation number one would be that when it says here, abuses of themselves of mankind or them that defile themselves of mankind, this could be someone who has participated in that activity, but not they did not desire it, they did not want that, but they could have gotten into it because of the fact that maybe they were raised by one of these weirdo couples and confused into that or, or brainwashed into that because now we have kids growing up in that environment. And back then they had the same thing in ancient Greece as well where someone could have just participated in this maybe because they were brainwashed or molested or confused or, or drunk or high, or maybe they just experimented with it and were disgusted by it. Still a wick, super wicked sin to even experiment with that. But does that make them a reprobate if they experimented with that? No, because the thing that makes them a reprobate, the Bible says the reprobate burns with lust one to another. So what are the homos of our day, the LGBT, what do they say? They say, oh, I'm not even attracted to women. I, I'm, just, I'm just totally attracted to men. You know what they're saying? Romans 1. That's what they're saying, aren't they? If they're going to sit there and say, oh, yeah, I, you know, I have no desire for women. I'm only, oh, well, then it sounds like you've left the natural use of the woman, and now you're burning in lust one toward another, men with men. Isn't that what they're saying? That's a Romans 1. Don't try to pin 1 Corinthians 6 on that. That's a Romans 1 situation. So that's, a, that's possible explanation number one, is that this term is talking about someone who abuses themselves with mankind or defiles themselves with mankind, but not that they like it, not that they desire it, not that they're burning in lust for it, but that they did it for whatever the reason or had it done to them for whatever the reason because they're being abused or defiled by this act, whatever it is, by submitting to it, that's what it is. Okay, that's explanation number one. Explanation number two is that this term, them that defile themselves with mankind or them that abuse themselves with mankind, could be referring to women. He could be saying, you've got whoremongers, because in 1 Timothy 1, the list goes whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind. So you could say the whoremonger is the guy that's going out and being with a bunch of women. And that them that defile themselves with mankind could be a woman who's going out and being with a bunch of men. That makes more sense than trying to turn Romans 1 on its head and turning the whole reprobate doctrine that's taught throughout the New Testament on its head. It's possible that this is referring to women who are defiling themselves with mankind. Yeah, but the Greek lexicon said it's a masculine word. Again, based on nothing. Because like I said, this word is not used anywhere outside of the Bible. And there's nothing about the word intrinsically that forces it to be a masculine word. It could be feminine, just like in English, where it's them that defile themselves with mankind, them that abuse themselves with mankind. That could be like the female version of a whoremonger, you know, going out and, and just sleeping around or doing whatever. That's explanation number two. Explanation number three, which is also a very likely scenario, is that what the Bible is saying here is not that the Corinthians had done all of these things, but that the Corinthians had been some wicked people in general, but not that they had specifically done everything on the list. And let me explain to you why that is a valid interpretation here. Because if we actually get the context, imagine that. Okay, the context of 1 Corinthians 6 is this. 
1 Corinthians 6 is a passage that is about not bringing lawsuits against your brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? And by the way, false doctrine always comes from things being taken out of context. Because when you read Romans 1 and you apply it the way we apply it, it's in context. I mean, that's what the whole chapter is. He's explaining that, how they got that way, you know, how that downward spiral goes when you reject the Lord. This, on the other hand, is not being used in its proper context. In 1 Corinthians 6, the context is, dare any of you, verse 1, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. And what he teaches here is, look, you if, you, if you have a judgment, if there's a lawsuit, if there's an issue where someone got ripped off, he said, you're better off to set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church than to be judged by the world. He's saying, you're going to get better judgment from the least esteemed in the church. Why? Because anybody who's a saved Christian in the church is better at judging than the unsaved world. And he explains, don't go to law before the unjust. Look at verse 1. We should go to law before the saints. What are the saints? The saved. And he says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, no, not one, that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, and because you go to law one with another, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Now let me ask you something. In verses 1 through 8, have we changed subjects at all? Or are we talking about the same thing the whole time? Lawsuits, judging, 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 right? What did he say at the beginning of verse 3? Know ye not, right? He continues the same argument in verse 9. Know ye not. So do, do, is verse 9 just introducing a whole new subject about evangelizing homos? No, we're on the same subject, okay? Here's what the subject is. The subject is don't go to law before the unjust Go to law before the saints. Even the least esteemed in the, in the church, let them decide before you let a heathen judge decide. Isn't that what the Bible's saying? Okay. Why? Why is it so bad to have the heathen judge you? Why is it so bad to take your brother or sister in Christ to court? Here's why. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what did he just say a minute ago? He said, don't you know that we're going to judge angels? He said, don't go to law before the unjust. Did you know that unjust and unrighteous are synonymous? Just, righteous, righteous, just. They're used interchangeably throughout the New Testament. They both mean the exact same thing. Most languages don't even have two different words for those two things. Okay, it's just the same word in almost every European language. So what he's saying here is, look, these unrighteous people that you want to judge you, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to judge angels. Are they going to do that? No, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Here's what he's doing. He's telling you what the unjust are like. This is what the unrighteous are like. When you go to the heathen to judge you, this is who you're asking to judge you. You're asking an unrighteous person to judge saved people, and that doesn't make any sense. Why? Because the unrighteous are what? They're fornicators. They're idolaters. They're adulterers. They're uh, effeminate. They're abused of themselves with mankind. And, and let me just stop right here and say, effeminate is not a homo. Effeminate is just a man who has feminine tendencies. And there are a lot of men out there who are not homos, but they just have feminine tendencies. And that is also wrong. That is also a sin. But it doesn't make them a sodomite, does it? And again, people will try to say, well, if you go back to the Greek, again, this, this is a very basic Greek word that simply means the soft ones. That's the literal meaning. And then they're going to try to say, oh, this is the passive partner and that relates. It's, you have a sick mind to even sit there and think that God is going to break that all down. You know, God doesn't break down all these categories of pan, gender fluid, 
you know, LGBTQ, non-binary. You think God gets into all that in the Bible and breaks down all these categories like that? No, God just has one category, sodomite. All of that is just under one category, reprobate. He doesn't break that down. And, well, you know, there's the, there's the effeminate and then, the, you know, no. The effeminate is just a girly man. Okay. Then you got the abuse of themselves with mankind. You've got thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying, look, those heathen that you're going to, this is what they're like. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, they are not qualified to judge you. That is the actual context if we read the chapter. Then verse 11, he says, and such were some of you. So why can we judge then? Because we're washed. Because we're sanctified. Because we're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What he's trying to say here is, look, even though some people in the church have a very wicked past, they are still qualified to judge because they are washed, because they are sanctified, because they are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's actually interpreting this in context. Instead of saying, well, this is a verse all about how the most rotten, sick, depraved weirdos can all get saved. That's taking this passage out of, is that what Paul had in mind? Here, let me sit down and write a chapter about how the sickest, weirdest perverts can still get saved. Is that what this chapter is about? No, see, see how they're just basically taking it out of context and using it as a proof text, not getting the meaning in context of what's being taught. Then when he gets to verse 12, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And he goes on to talk about the fact that, you know, just because, it, you know, legally you could take these people to law, maybe you can win in a courtroom, that doesn't make it right. And then he goes on to say, you know, meats for the belly, the belly for meats. God shall destroy both it and them. Don't be covetous. It's not just about possessions and meat and drink and, and what you can own. And, you know, let somebody rip you off. If someone takes your coat, let them have your cloak also. Right? It's the same thing Christ taught. That's actually studying the Bible in its proper context. Okay? So it's possible that what he is saying here is just that you, some of you used to be some majorly rotten people, but... You're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. They wouldn't have to have done specifically every single thing on the list. Now, let me prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that the people in 1 Corinthians 6 where he says, such were some of you, is not referring to someone who burns in lust toward another man. Go to chapter 10 of the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And let me just prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that Corinth did not have People in the church who used to burn in their lust toward other men. They didn't have that, and I'll prove it to you. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now let me ask you this. Is the temptation of a man being with another man, is that common to men? No. You know what common to men means? It means that we're all going through the same thing. If we have something in common, it means, hey, you're tempted to be greedy, so am I. You know, you're tempted to be angry, lose your temper at times in the wrong sense, so am I, right? You're tempted to lust after women, so am I, right? I mean, because there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Don't think to yourself, oh, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. Nobody understands. We all understand because we're going through the same type of things. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And the Bible says here, there is no temptation taken you, but such as common man. If the church had a bunch of former homos in it, how could Paul say to them, there is no temptation taken you, but such as common man, it would be false. Because they'd be, well, yeah, actually, I'm tempted by other dudes. And 99% of men aren't. Right. See what I'm saying? Right. Not only are 98, 99% of men not tempted with that, they're disgusted by it. They're horrified by it. They're revolted by it. They would pay any amount of money not to engage in it. They, you know, it's, it's disgusting. So the point is, that proves right there that they're misinterpreting chapter 6. And I gave you three other interpretations that all make more sense. And don't turn Romans 1 on its head. And, and do not turn 1 Corinthians 10 on its head. And just a quick review of what those were is that number one, it could just be referring to someone who had 
done something along those lines, but they didn't burn in lust toward other men. They didn't like it. They didn't desire it. They might have just uh, grown up under abuse and got pushed into something, confused into something, got drunk and done something, been high and done something, experiment. Look, let me give you an example. I spoke to a, a young man, and he, you know, wanted to check with me on this doctrine. And here's what he said. He said, look, when I was a child, I was molested. And so I was confused as a teenager, and I thought I might be a homo. So he said, I went and had one homo encounter because I just was so warped in my mind. And I'm people get molested. It warps their mind. Yeah. It's horrific. And that's why all child molesters should be taken out and shot. Amen. Because what they're doing is worse than murder. Amen. It's a wicked, horrible sin. Okay? It's a horrible crime. So anyway, he got abused and this messed with his mind. So he went out and tried it one time and he was disgusted by it, hated it and said, well, now I know I'm not that. Okay. Now look, is that guy, you think that guy's a reprobate? No, because he's not burning in lust toward him. Look, but did, did he, if, you know, according to possible explanation, number one, you know, did he abuse himself with mankind one time? Did he defile himself with mankind one time? Yeah, but I don't believe that guy's reprobate. You know, this is a guy that I know, and I believe he's a godly Christian. And, you know, that's what happened. And I can understand how kids could get warped or something and, and experiment with that. But he was immediately shocked and horrified by it and was like, this is disgusting. Never, you know, and, and was grossed out by it. Okay. And he came to me and, and asked me, you know, what did I think about that? And I told him, I said, no, I don't believe you're a reprobate. You know, you don't hate the Lord. You don't, you know, uh, feel that way. And I, I said, you know, you, you, the fact that you were disgusted by it. That's not what these reprobates in Romans 1, are they disgusted by it? They, they give themselves over to that. Okay. So that's explanation number one. Explanation number two is that it could be referring to females. You know, whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind. Because the Bible says in the same chapter, he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So you could see how that would go in the context with abusing yourself with mankind. Explanation number three is that, okay, an abuser with the, of himself with mankind, let's say that that is a homo. Okay, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the Corinthians had done that. It's just that they had been rotten people, not that they had done every single thing on the list. That's a third possible explanation. Now for the bonus point, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And, and how do we know that the Corinthians could not have been Romans 1 types? Because no temptation had taken them but what was common to man. Right. And because Romans 1 makes it clear that the people who burn in lust toward other men uh, hate the Lord. They don't even want to retain God. How can you get saved when you don't even want to retain God in your knowledge? You say, well, why do Sodomites want to go to church then? Only because they want to infiltrate every aspect of society. Amen. They want to infiltrate politics, music, sports, Hollywood, the church. They want to be normalized in every strata of society, right? Now, let me just prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt. Now, I'm going to deliver on my promise earlier when I said, I'm going to prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that this, this modern-day 2019 mainstream Christian doctrine on sodomites is not based on the Bible, it's not based on logic, it's not based on anything rational, it's only based on emotion and what they want to believe. Let me just prove that to you beyond any shadow of a doubt. According to these people, they're claiming that those that abuse themselves with mankind and those that defile themselves with mankind are for sure homos and that proves they can get saved. This is what's thrown in my face every single day by these liberals. Okay. Okay, well then let's, let's take their logic and let's take it right over to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and show how they have just defeated themselves. Okay? Let's plug in their wrong definition. Verse number 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. Okay, stop. What does the Bible just, what did the Bible just say? The law is made for those that defile themselves with mankind. 
What are they saying that that is? A homo. So, so that means that the law is made for homos, according to their logic, right? Okay, well, what, let's go to Leviticus 20.13 and see what the law says. <laughs> and you say, oh, well, no, we can't go back to the law. We're, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. The law is not made for a righteous man. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Who's the law for? Them that defile themselves with mankind. So how? So, so now, now we're going to repeal the law for those that defile themselves with mankind when the New Testament says in one of the latest books that was written in the New Testament, by the way, it says New Testament as you get, First and Second Timothy are some of the last books that Paul wrote. That's why he talks about how he's like about to die and stuff because it's the very end of his life that he's writing those pastors. And you can tell he wrote all three of them very close to one another because he's saying this, he's talking about all the same subject matter and everything. It's, it's, it's obvious the context is there. So if we go back to Leviticus, 2013, it says that uh, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now you say, well, that doesn't apply. Okay, what did 1 Timothy chapter 1 say? The law is not made for rights, man. The law is made for them that defile themselves with mankind. So if the law is applicable to anyone, it's applicable to them that defile themselves with mankind. And if they're going to say, well, that's the Leviticus 2013 crowd, then here's what I'll say. Okay, great. They can be saved. Kill them. <laughs> because isn't that what it says? You see what I'm saying? Now, obviously, I'm not saying we should kill them. I'm not telling you to kill them. But the government should kill them. It's the government's job to execute criminals. It's not my job. It's not your job. But do you see how this is a self-defeating argument they just want to pick and choose. Are they taking a whole view of Scripture? Are they looking at 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Timothy 1, Leviticus 20, and putting all the evidence on the table, sitting down and thinking about it, and walking away and saying, you know, Pastor Anderson's off base here. He's wrong. And, you know, here, here's what we believe. It should be totally legal. Bring them into church. Love them. Have them over to our houses. Let them come in the church. Uh, totally legal. Folks, did I, did I do what I said I was going to do? That's what we're... <laughs> ah! Checkmate. Game over. Insert coin. Okay? Because here's the thing. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, over in 1 Corinthians 6, it's a homo, so they can be saved. Okay, well, then that means over in 1 Timothy 1, it has to be a homo too. Then that means Leviticus 20.13 applies. Now, here's what I would like to challenge. Here's a, here's a challenge to the liberal Christians who don't believe in this, okay? Here's my challenge to them. Just a couple questions. And again, this is a very logical sermon here, okay? Question number one, should homosexuality be legal? Should it be legal? Now, Christians today think yes, even though it was illegal everywhere until the 1960s, 1970s. It was illegal everywhere. There was not a place in the year 1960 that this was legal. This was illegal everywhere. Okay? Does everybody understand that? So according to these people, it was God's will that these laws be rolled back and that these be made legal. And it was made legal in the last of the American states in 2003. So according to this logic of modern Christians, Basically, finally, we got right with God in 2003 by legalizing sodomy in 2003. Folks, is, does anybody hear how ridiculous that sounds? So we were wrong in 1600, wrong in 1700, wrong in 1800, wrong in 1900, wrong in 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1960. Wrong, 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 wrong. Finally, we got right with God and made it legal to be a homo. And then they're like, oh, you're trying to go back to Old... I'm not trying to go back to Old Testament. I'm trying to go back to like the, the 60s. That's not the Old Testament. Just so you know, the Old Testament started like... or, or ended like almost 2,000 years before that, Okay. So you see how this is not logical. And, and, but then people will say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it should be illegal. Yeah, yeah, you know, okay, you got me. You got me, it should be illegal. Okay, what should the punishment be? Uh, well, uh... 
So, you know, here's, here's a multiple choice for you, what the punishment should be for being a homo, according to our government. Multiple, a, a beating. B, go to prison. C, pay a fine. D, probation. <laughs> e, community service. F, die. Now here's the thing, if you choose anything, if you choose any of those besides F, then I'm going to ask you chapter and verse. What are you basing that on? Well, I just think they should go to prison. Really? So where, what verse did you get that from? Well, this has nothing to do with the Bible. Well, everything in my life has to do with the Bible. Amen. All of my whole worldview is shaped by the Bible. All my opinions, you know, are influenced by the Bible. So don't, don't tell me the Bible has nothing to do with it. When the Bible specifically says that the law is made for, and you're claiming that that's what that is. You're claiming that that's what those people are. Okay, well, then the law is made for them. What does the law say? But see, the problem is, look, if I sat down with any pastor and had that conversation, they cannot defeat that logic. How can you defeat that logic? Well, you know, but Christ taught forgiveness, blah, blah. Hold on a second. Whoa there, tiger. <laughs> if you're going to sit there and say, well, Christ taught forgiveness, okay, then, then basically we can't have laws against stealing then. Because Christ taught forgiveness. That's all. We're free in Christ. Jesus died for us, man. Okay, well, then you know what? You can't punish a rapist then then you can't punish murderers. You can't, I mean, then, then you're, well, no, no, you know. And these are the same people that think that speeding in your car should be illegal. Parking in the wrong place should be illegal. Painting your house the wrong color should be illegal. Everybody agrees that stealing should be illegal. Everyone agrees that, that kidnapping should be illegal. But then all of a sudden, it's like, well, except being a homo because Christ. Well, hold on. If you're going to say not being a homo because of the cross of Christ, well, then, okay, then you'd have to repeal every law then and just say, you know what? We just don't have any laws then. Or you'd have to say God was wrong when he said this. Or you'd have to say, well, that doesn't apply when 1 Timothy 1 said it specifically applied. They can't win this argument. But, but here's the thing. They won't even have this conversation. You know why they're not going to lose this debate? You know why they're not going to lose this conversation? You know why they're not going to uh, 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 fail on the logic? It's because they won't even have this conversation because they'd rather just stick their head in the sand and just pretend that these things are not happening and just have cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Here's what cognitive dissonance is. It's where the idea that you hold in your head does not match the reality of what you're actually seeing with your eyes, but you basically just hold these two contrary ideas to be true. So it's like, well, when, when we're in 1 Corinthians 6, it's homos. When we're in 1 Timothy 1, it's not homos, even though it's the same word. And, well, uh, when it comes to homos, you know, because of Christ, that's no longer against the law. But when it comes to stealing and murder and rape, that's all still against the law. Folks, this doesn't make any sense. No one can logically defend this garbage. They can give a lot of emotional defenses for it. Or they can just snow people with just, well, you know, there's the woman that's taken in adultery and everything. But if you took their actual logic of how they interpret that story, you would walk away believing in anarchy. And none of them teach anarchy. I mean, are they, why don't they just come out and say, I'm an anarchist, right? Because if, if anybody wants to enforce any biblical law, then they'll say, oh, you're a legalist. Well, you're an anarchist then. I don't believe in anarchy. You know, I believe that there are laws that are necessary to keep society. You know, and what happens when we make it legal, friend? Well, it just happened in 2003. How's that working out for us? How's it going there, America? And folks, what's happening right now, and I, I want you to understand this, what's happening right now is unprecedented in the history of mankind. Because there are areas that have delved into this sin, such as Sodom, such as ancient Greece, 
and then later even places in the Roman Empire like Pompeii, where this sin abounded. And God brought judgment. He destroyed the Greeks, he destroyed Sodom, and he destroyed Pompeii. He caused a volcano to erupt and just completely destroy Pompeii with fire and brimstone. And by the way, that happened in the New Testament because that's first century AD that God destroyed Pompeii with a volcano erupting. Okay, so what's different about today though is that right now today, the entire world is being given over to this right now. This has never happened. So yeah, it happened in little pockets where God nuked it, you know, whether it was Sodom, Greece, Pompeii, whatever. Now what we're seeing, and, th and there was that place in, ja in uh, Jamaica too, that island where they had it or that port, and it literally just sunk. What's it called? Port, port Royale. It's given over to sodomy, and it just was destroyed by God. Even the tour guide in Jamaica said God destroyed the city, and it just sunk and went, went down into the sea. Who was there at that tour when they explained that? I wasn't allowed to be there, but <laughs> I was in spirit there. So think about this now, okay? Just a few days ago in the news, Botswana... Botswana, which is, which is a, a, a very Christian culture, it's, it's not nearly as liberal or, uh, you know, as far down the road of degeneracy as the United States on this particular subject. Uh, when we were in Botswana, it was illegal to be a sodomite. I preached against it, and I was arrested in Botswana and thrown out of the country. And now, just a few days ago, they just legalized sodomy in Botswana just a couple days ago. Okay, so, you know, good job, Botswana. You know, idiots, you throw out the man of God. You throw, and they didn't just throw me out. They threw out all the preachers. They banned all the preachers. They threw out a whole bunch of people. They were rounding people up, arresting them, and throwing out all the missionaries. And you know what? What are the Christians in Botswana do? Why didn't the Christians in Botswana defend us and take our side... Not a single Botswana pastor stood up and said, I'm with you guys. I'm with Pastor Anderson. You know, I'm against the homos. And now they're getting their punishment. Now they're going to have the drag queen story time. They're going to have all the filth that we have here in the United States now. And it's not just Botswana. President Trump has announced we are going to make this legal in every country in the world. That's what President Donald J. Trump tweeted at the beginning of this month, he said, we will make homosexuality legal in every country in the world. Go look it up. That's what he tweeted. The real Donald Trump, you know, on that Twitter. <laughs> and so think about this. For the first time in the history of mankind, the entire world, it's not just California. It's Alabama. It's Mississippi. It's Arkansas. It's Florida. It's everywhere. It's not just the U.S. It's Canada. It's Mexico. Mexico just passed a law this week saying that the, the, the kids can wear the opposite clothing to school. The boys can wear skirts in Mexico City. That just came out this week. Okay. This is what's happening all month. This is ramping up. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. Same thing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Same thing that happened in Greece. Same thing that happened in Pompeii. And what this means is that it's very likely that we're approaching the end times. This is a sign of the times. Because it, for the first time, the degeneracy is global in nature. It used to be one country would get, get into this, and then God would bring another country to come wipe them out. You know, another army. Like the Romans came in and wiped out the Greeks. And didn't wipe them out, but they wiped out their power and, and subjugated them and put an end to a lot of the weirdness eventually, okay? So, what we see today, though, is if the whole world goes over to this, you know, it's going to be judgment from God. Directly, not just one nation being used to judge another. So anyway, the, the, the point is that we, as Christians, I'm going to finish in 1 Timothy, if you just want to flip there quickly, I'm, I'm done. But we need to understand that there's a lot of vain jangling out there. There are a lot of people who desire to be teachers of the law. They don't understand what they say. They don't understand what they affirm. Look, I have laid out to you tonight a very logical argument. I've proven the case from Scripture. 
There aren't any holes in it because I gave you four options. Any of those four, even if you reject all three of my options and you say, nope, all three of your options are wrong, Pastor Anderson, then you're nailed by the bonus point. <laughs> because then you have to agree that the law is for them. And what does the law say? So it's not like these people are saying, well, yeah, they should be put to death, but it's just that they can get saved. Let me ask you this. Has anybody read any of the news articles out of Orlando or Sacramento or when, when they attack us in the media? Put up your hand if you've read some of those articles. and stuff. Did any of them mention the fact that we said they can't be saved? No. It's not even, that's not even the issue. You know what the issue is? Leviticus 2013. That's the issue. <laughs> and so if they want to just insist that abuse of themselves of mankind has to be a full-blown sodomite, then they just dug their own grave over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. What's it, which one is it going to be? You know, and, and so it's checkmate for the watered-down Christians. But the problem is they're not even playing chess. It would be chess. Yeah, they're playing checkers. No. <laughs> the, the, the point is, if, you know, we can't even say it's a checkmate because they're not even at the table. In order for me to put them in checkmate, they'd have to actually play a game of chess. What they're doing instead is hiding and just not confronting this issue. Or they're walking up and they're, they're bringing a totally different game. They're bringing checkers, you know, and, and, and just trying to, to uh, you know, not talk about the real issues. The big boy game of chess, right? They wanted to play a kid game. Checkers. So he gives this teaching in, in 1 Timothy about the law. And then he ends it with this. He says in verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy... According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So anyway, since you didn't get to go to the Massa conference, I bring a little bit of the Massa conference to you. And what I'm saying is, we, like Timothy, need to war a good warfare. We need to hold fast to the faith. We need to hold fast to the doctrine. We need to hang on and don't give any ground. And, you know, are, are people going to fight us on it? Sure, but that's why we need a war, a good warfare. And don't swerve. Don't get off course. Stay with it. I like what Patrick Boyle said. They played him on the news media saying this. I watched a news clip from Orlando. Here's what Pastor Patrick Boyle said. He said, well, it's just this has always been the doctrine and we're just not changing this has always been the Christian teaching, and that is the truth. The Christian teaching has never been a pandering doctrine. But this is a new doctrine that's, that's saying, oh, make it legal. That was unknown until 1960. Unknown to say, make it legal. And if it's illegal, punish it with death, because that's what Leviticus 20.13 says. Now you say, what's the point in preaching that since you're never going to control the government anyway? The point in the preaching is that I have a good conscience. I'm holding faith and a good conscience. I go to bed tonight and I know I preached the truth and didn't preach lies. And you know what? I sent out a thundering message that rings through the airwaves and then people will fear God and realize how much God hates this. Instead of this watered-down, sissified doctrine that is strengthening the hands of the evildoers today. So mark my words, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, people will flock to our church. People will flock to other churches in our movement. Our churches will grow exponentially because of the fact that this is going to get weirder. Even under... Donald Trump, this isn't slowing down. And the weirder it gets, the more people are going to listen to this kind of preaching. And, you know, they're going to start to get mad at their pastor who's not preaching this. They're going to start to get angry and say, you let us down. You, you are asleep and you let our country turn into Sodom and Gomorrah. You let these weirdos take over and you were hiding, you were silent. And you know what? When that happens, people are going to flood to our church. It's already happening. That's why our churches are growing so fast. And you know what? When they do show up, we're going to put a New Testament in their hand and send them out soul winning, and we're going to do a great work for God. Amen. 
So I'm encouraged. We're, we're always, we, God always gives us the victory. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And, and, and we're, we're faced with, um, as the Bible says in 2, Tim, or 2 Thessalonians 3, unreasonable and wicked men. Unreasonable and make it wicked men. That's what we're dealing with, Lord. Because it's unreasonable to have this mainstream view that's, that's, that's tolerant toward sodomites. It's not reasonable. It doesn't jive with Scripture. Lord God, I pray that those that are actually saved, those that have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, would be reasonable. And not just blindly go with one thing or the other, but to actually study the scriptures that we looked at tonight, to actually ponder the teachings of the Bible, and come up with a doctrine that actually matches scripture, Lord. And we ask these things in, in Jesus' name, amen.